Wonderful. Welcome, folks. Hey, Patricia. And Jesse, you should be able to see the participant list if you wanted to take a gander at the folks in the audience this evening. Great. Thank you all for joining. We are just going to give it a minute or two to let folks trickle in. Appreciate that you all are here. For those of you who are joining us, as we give it another minute, uh, if you feel inclined, please feel free to drop in the chat where you're joining us from, or maybe even something that you are excited to learn about this evening. We're gonna give it just one more minute. Ohio, cool, hi Ron, welcome. Windsor, Santa Rosa. Whoa, someone's joining us from Alberta, Canada. Hello, Jillian. Western Massachusetts, Petaluma, Pescadero. Oh, wow. This is phenomenal. Thank you all for being here. Wow, all over the board. Okay, I look forward to running this report and seeing who all is in attendance this evening. Yeah, we've got great representation across the yeah. USA. Rainwater. And what a timely topic. I hope majority of the folks on this webinar got to experience a little bit of rain today. And if not, maybe a little bit this weekend too. I love that. Please continue to con uh, drop in the chat where you're joining us from and anything that you're excited to learn. I'm going to go ahead and kick things off for this program uh, and give a warm welcome to all of you. I appreciate your time and your interest in this topic and welcome to our program titled Reusing the Rain, Do-It-Yourself Rain Barrel Systems. Tonight's presentation is brought to you by a collaboration with Daily Axe and the City of Santa Rosa, as well as our special guest, Jesse Savo, who is going to be leading us through this evening's program. Hello, everyone. My name is Liz, and I am the Climate Resilience Program Manager with Daily Axe. I'm joined by my colleague, Ava, who is helping with some tech support. Thank you, Ava. And I want to share a little bit of context to our organization, Daily Axe. For those of you who don't know, Daily Axe is a small and mighty environmental education nonprofit that is based in Petaluma, California, and working throughout Sonoma County. Our mission is to inspire actions that will create more connected, equitable, and climate resilient communities. Our climate resilience team focuses on community connection and education with all of our programming having an emphasis on hands-on people-powered solutions to conserving water, building healthy soil, and supporting habitat. We educate on a variety of different topics and have departments that also focus on civic leadership and engagement in an effort to influence policy. Our impacts are far and wide, and we certainly hope that tonight's event will inspire you to take action in your own home, as well as to help others on their resource conservation journey. So as you can see, we are in a Zoom webinar format this, meet, this evening. That means there are gonna be a few ways that you can engage with the program. First, for any and all questions, please drop them in the Q&A box that you should see at the bottom of your screen. If there are places to pause during the presentation, we'll go ahead and address questions, but for the most part, we will hold, hold most of the questions until the end of the presentation. If you have any resources to share or would like to interact with fellow participants or uh, our panelists, please use the chat box. If you are a Santa Rosa water customer, please be sure that your participant name is up to date with your first and last name as I will be running a report and doing a raffle. If you need to change your name, you can find the participant list that is either at the bottom or the top of your screen. Find your name, click those three dots in the upper right hand corner and click rename. Lastly, this program is being recorded, so we will share the recording as well as any resources that are shared in this evening's program uh, in a follow-up email within the next week. I also noticed a few folks had their hand raised um, in the, the Zoom settings. Please be sure just to write your comments in the chat box, please. So now I wanna get started with some additional context setting. 
uh, context setting around the urgency for water conservation. I am sure that we are all aware that our state has been facing severe drought conditions for quite a while. Our water sources are scarce, wildlife is negatively impacted, and we may even be seeing increases in our water bills. For so many reasons, it is important to recognize that the drought is still here and that we need to be taking action every day to do our part to conserve and reuse water in every way possible. In partnership with Sonoma Water, Sonoma County relies on Lake Sonoma and Mendocino to supply our drinking water. Both of these lakes rely on rainfall to refill and have been critically low due to the lack of rainfall that we have experienced in the last year. Currently, Lake Sonoma is only at about 43% of its capacity and Lake Mendocino is at about 67%. For both bodies of water, this is about 25% lower than previous years. In order to lessen the impact of drought, the city of Santa Rosa is enforcing a 20% reduction in water use and is asking all residents to eliminate water waste and to adopt water conservation practices, which I'm going to highlight briefly. So currently in Santa Rosa, it is prohibited to wash hard surfaces with potable water. Instead, they recommend to sweep away any debris. It is prohibited to pressure wash with potable water. All leaks inside and outside of the home should be repaired. And the city of Santa Rosa has some great resources on their website to better understand how you can test and repair your leaks. It is required that all hoses are equipped with a shutoff nozzle. And lastly, landscape irrigation should be scheduled to turn on during the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. The city of Santa Rosa has a long-standing commitment to water efficiency, and there are ample resources available for all of us to access, uh, from rebates, education programs, and tools, again, to help test and repair leaks. I really want to encourage folks to visit not only the city of Santa Rosa website, but visit your own city's website as well. I'm sure most uh, municipalities are offering resources for you to better understand your water consumption and how to be more water wise. I wanna uplift Santa Rosa's Water Smart website because it is a really great place to start uh, when you're trying to determine the many ways that you can save water and money. Again, for anybody outside of Santa Rosa, I would still encourage you to check out this website, but also your own city's website to see what resources and rebates might be available to you. In Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa water customers are eligible for a rainwater rebate. So right now, it used to be 25 cents a gallon. Right now, it's 50 cents a gallon for the rebate, I believe, through May 2022. So if you are looking to install a rain barrel system after this program, please be sure to check out the city's website to understand the process of acquiring this rebate. I think the main thing to be mindful of with most of Sonoma, Sonoma County rebates is that you need to be sure that you are pre-qualified before starting your project. Um, again, we will be sending resources after this program to help you understand what is available to Santa Rosa water customers. All right, without any further ado, I am pleased to introduce our instructor for this evening, Jesse Sabo. Jesse founded Blue Barrel in 2012 in an effort to make rainwater harvesting accessible for as many people as possible. She graduated from Stanford in 2003 and earned her master's in ecological design at the Conway School in 2008. Jessie is a certified permaculture designer, graduate of the ECOSA Institute's intensive course in sustainable design, and is a fellow of the Leadership Institute for Ecology and the Economy. Jessie understands rainwater harvesting as one of the many measures to bring our households into balance with the Earth's capacity to thrive. We are so thrilled to have you here tonight, Jesse. Thank you for this partnership, and I'm excited to learn from you. Thank you very much, Liz. I too am excited to be here and with all of you from all over, really, and thankful for the city of Santa Rosa for putting this on. Um, let's see here. I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see how smoothly we can do this. So how's it looking, Liz? Did we do it? You did great, Jesse. Thank you. 
Good. Okay, so just quickly to go over our agenda, um, we're going to talk about why we want to reuse the rain. Um, we're going to talk about how to size a system, and we'll go over some examples of types of rain barrels and tanks. We'll talk about a few design considerations. Uh, we'll also talk about some more passive rainwater harvesting methods that include swales and basins, um, and then some conclusions to put it all together. And then Liz will take it back over for the closing slides. And we'll, we will save questions at the end. And um, just so everybody knows, I am horrible at monitoring a chat while I present. So I'm not even gonna try. The chat I think is mostly for participants to discuss amongst yourselves. And then um, as Liz said, the Q&A is a place to put questions that um, Liz will then read, read back to me at the end of the presentation. So um, let's dive in. Um, so what are we looking at here? This is where we all live. And you might think this is planet Earth, but I'm borrowing a phrase from Brock Dolman at OAEC. This is actually planet water. So if you take a look at it from this vantage point, you see just lots and lots and lots of water and we all share it. Um, and I want to take us all the way back to fourth grade here and just briefly go over the hydrologic cycle because I think Liz gave us some great context on drought conditions in Sonoma County and um, in Santa Rosa area. And I know there are other parts of the country that experience droughts and deluges, stormwater issues, um, and all of that's related. Um, but the truth is we don't have any less water on our planet than we ever did. Water, it's a closed loop cycle. It's a global cycle. Um, and so water rains down and it hits the surface of the earth and some of it's going to run off the earth and make its way into streams and the ocean. Um, and then importantly, some of it's going to infiltrate into the ground. So you see this arrow and Liz, let me ask you, do you see my cursor on the screen or no? I do. You do. Okay. That's a little, that's helpful. Um, and then it can get locked up in the ocean for a really long time. A single water molecule, once it gets in the ocean, can stay there for a million years plus. So just keep that in mind as we go through further slides, we're going to understand better why we have drought when water cycles this way globally, and it's all still here on planet water. So what's going on? So it, it really makes sense to look at development impacts. So we're talking about human impacts now, and this is what people do to the earth. So what you're looking at on the left-hand side of the screen is what water does in, in nature on any kind of natural ground cover. And interestingly, it doesn't actually matter if we're talking about a lush forest or a dry desert or a savanna. These are kind of proportions of what water does roughly. So in, in a natural environment, about 40% of the rain that hits the ground is gonna evaporate back up. So that's represented by this big arrow. Um, it's a bigger word, evapotranspiration, that includes also water that's kind of breathed back up through plants and um, animals and living things on earth. Um, and then we have these two arrows underground representing 25% is shallow infiltration and 25% deep infiltration. So a full half of the rainfall that falls in nature is gonna make its way underground to hydrate soils and plants, um, stimulate that microbiology, and then even get down into the deep reservoirs of our aquifers. Um, and then this tiny little arrow is the remaining 10% of water that becomes runoff and runs off the surface of the earth. So um, in that natural hydrologic cycle image that we showed, that runoff arrow is actually pretty small. There's not a lot of water um, just sheeting off the surface of the ground. So let's take a look at a developed landscape. And these numbers assume 75% impervious ground cover. Um, and that's a big word for hard, well, hardscape is another way to say it, but it's just the hard surfaces that block the water from getting into the ground. Those would be roadways, your roofs, often even lawns or compacted, compacted topsoil, um, parking lots, and all those things you can think of. So in, in this more um, suburban environment, we have 30% of the water evaporating to create clouds. So already you see a 25% reduction from 40 to 30% in cloud formation. So you see how local weather is. And some of you may have heard the term urban heat island effect that's related. All of these, all these cycles work a certain way in nature. And when, when we develop our environments in certain ways, we start to interrupt that. Um, but then here's what's really amazing to me. Uh, underground, we have 10% shallow infiltration and only 5% deep infiltration, and then a whopping 55% runoff. So what our developed environments have basically done, all the pavement around us, 
is blocking water from getting underground and it's telling it instead to leave the community. So water is just sheeting off the surfaces of our land here. So, so that, I hope that really makes a point. That's how we create drought, really. Um, so what do we do about it? Um, I have a few more slides to sort of illustrate the ecology side of things. So um, I chose these two pictures off the internet just to kind of find the starkest contrast that I could imagine. But you see on the left, you can almost see that whole hydrologic cycle working there um, with the snowpack on the mountain and that water is going to get down into the spongy forest floor here. And then we have all that evapotranspiration happening. This, these trees are basically breathing and creating clouds right there. And the whole cycle is very local. It's keeping, keeping water is being kept and held in that system. Um, and then on the right is pretty much the worst of what humans are capable of. So luckily, most of the city of Santa Rosa doesn't look like this, although some of it might, but you've got a channelized stream. And um, the numbers I showed you before had 15% water infiltrating. Well, in this environment, I doubt even that much is. And meanwhile, all the activity that's happening in this hardscape is creating a lot of pollution. So it's now polluted water that's um, running off and getting back into our waterways. Um, so there's sort of a um, quip phrase that we use in the rainwater harvesting world, and it's slow it, spread it, sink it, store it. And that is as opposed to pump it, pipe it, pave it, and pollute it. Um, these graphics are courtesy of Brad Lancaster, who's a wonderful resource for rainwater harvesting. And he actually lives in Tucson, Arizona, where it's very dry. Um, a lot of people, even in California, think it's too dry for rainwater harvesting to be um, an effective thing to do. And I hope um, that this presentation, if, if you're still having doubts about that, I hope you keep listening because we're going to convince you otherwise here. So anyway, um, up the, the upper picture is sort of maybe a conventional landscape where where you have um, water, basically the environment's designed to sheet the water to the gutter system. So you have these berms around the trees that are actually keeping the water from getting in and you want water to get away from the building. And you sure do, you want water to get away from the building. Um, but the, the new way of thinking about it, slow it, spread it, sink it. In this picture, you see they've kind of just done subtle things to reverse the flow of water. So they're inviting the water. Here, here you see a curb cut. Um, and you see sunken planting basins. So the idea of sinking um, your planting area is gonna help it naturally attract more water. And then here you have an active rainwater harvesting tank collecting the water from the roof and the overflow from that tank is getting into this tree basin. So um, it's, it's just a new way of thinking about what we wanna do with water. We wanna invite it in instead of inviting it to leave. All right, so why reuse the rain? We've already talked a little bit about some of it, but changing climate and weather, drought and cycles of drought and deluge are getting more severe. And part of that is because of the way we've developed our landscapes. Um, harvesting rainwater reduces erosion and stormwater pollution. So in, in California, we tend to think of it as a water conservation technique, but we have people joining us from all over the country I saw someone from Canada too, and maybe even elsewhere. Um, and, and in wetter parts of the globe, people think of it as stormwater retention, stormwater management. And really, in no matter what climate you're in, it's both. Those are two sides of the same coin. Um, it's really about water sustainability. We're helping water cycle the way it would in nature. We're um, reducing our impacts. Uh, recharges groundwater, so that infiltration, we're restoring that. Um, reduces energy use. Oh, there's, there's something called the energy water nexus. And a lot of people don't realize how energy intensive it is to pump pipe and treat and uh, heat water and deliver it to everywhere it's needed. So the more water that you use from a non, from a local source, water collected from your roof, essentially, um, you're reducing your carbon footprint as well. Emergency preparedness is something to think about. Um, we're not going to get deep into that. And I do have to make the point that water that you collect from the roof and put in storage is not potable. You can't drink out of a rainwater tank, but you, you can treat water to drink it in an emergency. Um, and then rainwater is very high quality water. So I'll go over that in a minute. And it's actually going to improve your soil and it's really good for your plants. So let's look at that a little more closely. Um, Rainwater is free of the salts, chemicals, and minerals that are found in all other water sources. It is 100% soft water. 
and it collects a small amount of organic matter from the rooftop, which is basically a light application of fertilizer every time you water. So this is the same reason we don't want to drink the water, but your plants actually really like having that material. It is naturally slightly acidic, um, which helps maintain soil pH. And organically grown vegetables want soil pH ranging from 5.5 to 6.5, which is exactly what rainfall tends to be. Um, and here's another thing people don't realize, and, and I, I learned this you know, a few years in to presenting on this topic, but um, uh, city water is treated to be alkaline. And I don't, I don't know if anyone from the city of Santa Rosa is here to correct me if I get this wrong, but I wanna say it's treated to about eight, pH eight. Um, and that's to protect the pipe network. There's still copper piping and things like that. Um, so the water that you get from your hose is alkaline and your, your soils, that builds up in your soils and they don't like it. So um, if you start irrigating with, with rainwater, you're gonna get a better pH balance in your soils. And then lastly, rainwater contains some nitrates, which is the bioavailable form of nitrogen, one of the very important macronutrients for plants. Okay, hey, so we want to start thinking, slow it, spread it, stink it, store it, and what are some of the strategies for doing that? Um, as we move along through this presentation, um, we'll talk about how to assess your water retention opportunities. We will talk a little bit about how to think for and install rain barrels or tanks. Um, and also we'll talk about the passive side, which is swales and rain gardens. So just a quick definition, um, passive harvesting, you, you can harvest rainwater without any tanks or anything. You can ask the earth to do it for you by shaping the landforms in certain ways to invite the water in. And that's called passive harvesting because you're just kind of creating a form um, where the water is going to flow through and trade in. Um, when you start employing tanks and barrels, that's called active harvesting because you now have control over how that water is used. Um, but either way, you know, beyond that, beyond just water conservation and storage, all these uh, dry terms, if you can call it that, um, I like to think of it in terms of you're really increasing your living sponge and vitality in your garden. Um, so I think of it as really healthy water that you can now use to support um, a very alive landscape where you're creating habitat and food and whatever makes you happy in the garden. And you're allowing that water to cycle, you're allowing nutrients to cycle, you're allowing carbon to cycle. Um, there are just so many benefits to that. So I, I'm not a proponent of fake lawns as a water conservation technique. To me, water conservation is just, uh, uh, water conservation is the view of it. The positive view is how do we bring our earth than our planet and our water cycle back to life. So that's really what we're doing. Let's see, can we advance a slide? And did I skip a slide? No, okay. So water storage versus water shortage. So I'm not here telling you not to convert, uh, conserve water, but I am telling you if we all kind of tuned into this, we don't really have a water shortage issue. We have a water storage issue. Um, so to illustrate that, let's use some really round numbers that hopefully you can remember. Um, that is that just a single inch of rain falling on a thousand square foot rooftop surface is going to give you over 600 gallons of high quality irrigation water. Um, that's a lot. So to put that in perspective, that's enough to fill 11 55 gallon rain barrels. Um, and that's just one inch and that's just a thousand square feet. Your, your home may well be larger than that. So um, this is a statistic um, that Daily Axe um, dug up, but in the worst drought recorded, Sonoma County averaged 23 inches of rain. And that means the average home could have stored almost 36,000 gallons or captured 36,000 gallons. So you start, you know, when, when we start thinking about, does it really make sense in dry climates? Yes. With dry climate, the, the, um, the trick is you have to store it when it falls to be able to use it when it's dry. And that's why we're here. So let's talk about how to size the system. And there's really three things to consider. Um, the first is how much you can catch from your roof. And we've just kind of touched on that a little and we'll get deeper into that. Um, but spoiler alert, you're gonna find it's a lot. So then you wanna start refining your analysis a little bit. You wanna think about how much you're really gonna use. Um, and then beyond that, how much space and budget do you have? So the truth is, um, even if it's not realistic for you, and for many people it won't be, to harvest enough water to service your entire landscape year round um, in, in a climate like California, 
um, you can take a big chunk out of your water use um, by assessing the space you have for water storage and dedicating that water to certain areas of your garden. I saw someone say they were interested in that water for deep watering trees. It's great to think about certain uses. Um, I also know um, people who raise uh, orchids or carnivorous plants, that water, the, those plants are very sensitive and they really benefit from rainwater. So you can even start thinking of niche uses or just the planted areas around your, your rainwater system. So to check out how much you can harvest from your roof, um, first you measure your catchment area. And what that is, it's just the flat footprint that your roof covers. So if you think about that hydrologic cycle, you just want to know how much water your, your roof is blocking from that flat ground. So luckily, you don't have to really worry about the pit or the roof plan much. Um, there's no trigonometry involved. Uh, so this graphic is showing you that these three wildly different roof plans are actually the same roof footprint. Um, and we're going to get a little uh, more refined on that because you do want to figure out which section of your roof is drowning to the downspout you're going to collect from. And of course, you can collect from multiple downspouts, but we'll hit that um, uh, in a couple slides here. Um, but a, a little more on the math and to bring it closer to Santa Rosa, average annual rainfall in Santa Rosa is 30 inches. Um, so to come to find out where these numbers come from, you just convert everything to feet and cubic feet to get a volume of water. So 30 inches divided by 12 is going to get you 2.5 feet a year of rain. And we're using that small round number, thousand square foot roof again. So we multiply by that to get 2,500 cubic feet. Now, then we convert cubic feet back into gallons. Um, and the conversion factor for that is 7.48. So, um, so 2,500 cubic feet times the 748, it's 18,700 gallons annually in Santa Rosa from a thousand square foot rooftop. Um, and again, you might say, well, when's the last time we had average rainfall? Cut that in half. It's still out of water. <laughs> so um, and then, well, well, we'll refine this in a future slide. You don't have to remember the math. It's really 0.6 gallons per square foot of roof per inch of rain. And you don't even have to remember that because there are some pretty amazing online calculators out here. This is a tool that I like everybody to know about. Um, it's a free website. It's uh, permadesign.com is the website. And I do have this on a resource slide at the end. Um, but what this lets you do, they have a Google map embedded. So you can actually enter your address and then it has a tracing tool. So you can trace those roof lines and actually figure out um, those square footages. So it, it generates, it, and I, I put these stars on to represent where the downspouts might be um, and then the water flow. But so, so this whole section here is draining up to this front downspout. Um, and the, what I do, they actually have some rainfall data in here and I don't know where they get that data. And these numbers, it'll calculate the volume for you that's coming off of each segment of the roof. So this um, Eastern panel and you get to name you know, you can enter your own names here, um, is about a thousand square feet there. Um, the, I don't know how accurate these volumes are. So what I like to do is use this really for measuring the, the roof areas. And then I can enter um, those segments into another rainwater calculator. So this one's one that's on our website. This is at bluebarrelsystems.com. And it's just a very simple calculator. You enter a footprint area. And here I put 400 square feet because that's a little more realistic for maybe one section of a roof that's going to be draining to one downspout. And then I use 2.75 for rainfall because I think that's going to be a pretty heavy rainy period. And I just want to make sure I can fill my system with, with a storm because I'm going to get a lot of and draw down just because there's 18,000 gallons of water available to me. I need to store that much because I'm going to be using it and I'm going to be getting refills um, throughout the season. So just with with these numbers, that's enough to catch 660 gallons. And again, that's, that's the, the 11 uh, barrels there. So quite a lot of water available. When it comes to understanding how much you're going to use, and again, I wanna make the point that just because you have tens of thousands of gallons available, it's not necessarily practical to store that much um, because it really only needs to get you from the last and the first rains of each year. 
So what this is showing, this is for Santa Rosa, but this is precipitation in Santa Rosa, the red line. So you see everyone who lives in Santa Rosa knows that we don't get a lot of rain between May and September and often through October. So that's a long, hot, dry season. Um, interestingly, this green line is the U.S. average. So most of the country um, has much more regular rainfalls. They're getting the summer rains. Um, and in those areas, the smaller rainwater catchment systems are actually really effective. Effective. You can, you know, service your short irrigation seasons between rains with a small system. Um, it's in California where you want um, where you want the bigger systems. And here on this slide, I like to tell an anecdote too, because when I was just um, starting Blue Barrel in 2012, and I think 2013 was the driest year on record at the tail. Uh, uh, and, and I don't know if that's still true. We've had a lot of drought years since then. Um, but we we were just starting the company and we did a rain barrel workshop in the town of Windsor in May, thinking, well, this is going to sit here dry all summer. It is what it is, and it'll be ready to collect the rain in the fall. Well, anyway, we got a late rain that year on June 26th, I want to say there was June rain. And often we do get that even in drought years. And if you're not collecting the water, you forget that that happened. If you are collecting the water, you suddenly have some full irrigation vessels. And then it, it rained again on September 6th, which is actually really early. So even though it was the driest year on record, this flat line here was really short, which meant that people who were harvesting rainwater were really doing the right thing. I mean, they were able to sustainably service their garden with that really healthy water um, that otherwise would have just kind of run off and disappeared. Okay, so let's get into a little more deeply about the design. This is the basic anatomy of an active rainwater catchment system, and we will go into passive a little bit later. Um, but you know, first, obviously, you need a catchment surface. That's usually going to be your roof. And by the way, now that you've seen some of these numbers, don't discount garden sheds. If you're irrigating a garden and you have an outbuilding um, and you want to store the water out near your garden, um, which is practical for being able to irrigate with gravity, your garden shed may very well be big enough to, to fill a decent size system. Um, and then your, your home or your structure will need gutters and downspouts as a way to convey the water. That's called the conveyance system. Um, and from there, the water needs to go through a filter or a flush. Um, I'll talk about the flush um, in a minute. First flush is something you may have heard about. But the truth is, um, there's actually code in place to just make sure people are doing this safely. And um, 16th and inch, sorry, 16th inch mesh filter is required as rough filtration for any water going into the tank. And that's just enough to keep any big particulates out um, that are gonna create blockages and growth. Um, and it also keeps mosquitoes out. So that's really important. Um, and then you're gonna need an inlet, which is basically just the, the pipe or hose that gets the water into your tank. The storage, very simple, is the vessel itself, tanks or barrels. Um, the outlet is how you get the water out and you can have multiple outlets, but here we see this is pretty typical a spigot maybe six to 12 inches off the ground. And you will need an overflow um, because of the numbers we just discussed um, your tanks and barrels will fill and then you have to think about um, where that water is going to go in the end. Um, and by the way, we do we do have downspout diverters. Um, if there's time, I'll show those. There are downspout diverters that actually direct the water back down the original downspout um, to kind of take the overflow um, uh, project out, at least initially. Um, and then vents. So it is important for a, a rain barrel or tank to be, it should be closed. And if you go on Google for DIY ideas, you'll see that there are people who collect in trash cans or open vessels. Um, and even if you screen them, the truth is that can be tough. You get sunlight in there. If you don't screen it properly, you can get mosquitoes. Often there's a lip at the top that's collecting water at the top. Um, any sunlight in there is going to create algae. So really a closed vessel is best. And then that does need to be vented. And I put um, foundation in parentheses because it's not a core part of the system anatomy, but water is really heavy. So it's important to have a flat and level and solid foundation. So usually um, instead of putting something like this straight on soil, you'd create a pad with base rock. Um, some people pour concrete. You, I don't like, we don't want to encourage more hardscape if we don't have to. So a base rock type permeable um, gravel would be useful. 
So just quickly to define that first flush, because I know anyone who's researched rainwater harvesting may have come across this. What you see here on the right is um, a, a rain tank and it's collecting from the roof. And this is a called a leaf eater. And that, that's a rough filter that's doing that filtration job. Um, but then this pipe actually comes down next to the tank and it catches the first flush of water. So what that means is presumably the first rain of the season is going to be the dirtiest. It's carrying all summer's worth of from your roof. So the idea is capture that water in this pipe and then it's cleaner water that spills over. Um, so, the, you know, and you, you can research those. The truth is most rainwater harvesting professionals don't recommend these. They're not code required. Um, it's difficult to size them properly. There's, you don't want them oversized, to be, especially in our, that'll keep water from going into your tanks and you don't want them undersized because then they won't do their job and can actually introduce more concentrated um, particulates into the tanks. Um, so, and they do require some maintenance. They need to be emptied and cleaned out. And often that's the only maintenance. Otherwise, a rain barrel is a really low maintenance system. So if you're not going to do that maintenance, it can create more problems than it solves. Um, so anyway, most rainwater harvesting professionals, especially if you're just using the water for garden irrigation, uh, the, the benefit, the true benefit of these just is unclear. So it's really the leaf eater that's necessary. And this is a blue barrel system here. And this is that downspout diverter that actually will carry water when the barrels are full. This is hoses installed and the water actually goes back down the down as normal. So those are just a few details. Um, we'll take a minute to just look at a whole bunch of different ways that rain barrels and tanks can look. Um, these are, uh, the easiest starting point is a rain barrel and it's not very big. And again, if you're joining us from farther away, somewhere in the middle of the country or um, in the South or the East Coast, you may get a good amount of efficacy out of a small system, a couple of rain barrels. Um, but there's there's plenty available prefab. That's what you're looking at on the left. And you can see that system anatomy here, the water's coming in. It looks like this one is screened on top. Um, and it's got the outlet and it has a drain here at the bottom. It is not clear where the overflow is going on this. So let's hope that these people <laughs> have a pipe somewhere because otherwise you, th this is not gonna hold a lot of water. Um, and then here's what a DIY example might look like. It's the same anatomy. They have a couple drains here and just note, you know, they have a spigot here. When the water level come drops below that spigot, you're not going to get water out of it anymore. And the same is true. You see, there's actually, um, there's going to be some water trapped and a bunch of sediment trapped underneath the level of those drains too. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, these are multi-barrel systems and um, you can find on Google all kinds of designs and is people piping water from, they'll usually be connected near the top of the barrel, which means barrel number one fills and then overflows into number two and then into number three. Um, these are actually blue barrel systems and um, uh, both of these are taken in Santa Rosa. Um, the, this system design is plumbed along the bottom, which is actually really unique because what's happening here is all the water goes in through barrel one, it floods the underpipe, and then all of these, all six of these barrels are going to fill and empty together. So that has a lot of benefits because you don't have to move hoses, you don't have to know which barrels are full and empty, um, and all of that water is accessible through this one spigot here. And here you see that leaf catcher, and here's just another example. Now this one actually, <laughs> we just moved, but this used to be my house. Um, this house is going on the market later this month for anyone who wants to move into a house that already has 20 rain barrels on it. Um, shameless plug. Um, but anyway, this little black line here is a gravity fed drip irrigation line. And we'll talk about that a little. And this is only three barrels right here. Um, at the back of the house, there's, um, there's an eight barrel system and a seven barrel system and additional system. Um, but they each service the area right around it. So this little planted area is serviced by gravity with these barrels. Um, if you're thinking bigger, um, and I always encourage people to think bigger if you have the space and the budget for that, you're going to want to look for tanks. And Bushman is an Australian company, but their tanks are available at Harmony Farm Supply and I think probably a number of other outlets. Um, and they come in all different shapes and sizes, but it's a similar anatomy. And they, they come with it. The, there's an inlet and an overflow. Um, and you see they have even some more flat profile um, tanks that can be kind of ballasted to a fence or a wall. And this one's interesting. 
these are the rainwater hogs. So this is also an Australian company and these are not cheap, but these, these, you can actually create fences and retainers. Um, and you know, this one's actually inlaid into a deck. So there are lots of creative things when you start thinking about water storage and places that you could store water. And rain barrels can be beautiful too. So, you know, people, especially, you know, with blue barrel, we focus on the recycled um, blue barrels, which are the ones that are, they're the food grade drums that come out of the waste stream and they're just blue by industry standard. Um, and they're also UV resistant. So that's important. But for those who don't like that look or any look of rain barrels, there's all kinds of things you can do. So believe it or not, that's a blue barrel system under there. One, one of our customers did a really creative thing with just some simple wood slats and plumber's tape there. Um, and then this one here, uh, just painted to match the house. And then of course you don't have to limit your creativity. There's all kinds of creative ways to paint barrels or decorate them, um, or plant around them. People have done really neat things with trellises. So just to catch up with ourselves a little um, some design uh, considerations. Tanks and barrels should be installed near existing downspouts. So that's just for the practicality of being able to, the downspouts where the water already collects, and then you need to get that into the rain barrel. And then near or uphill from an irrigation area, ideally. So unless you're doing a bigger system where you're going to be pumping water all around, you're probably going to want to use gravity fed irrigation, which means you do just need to make sure your water level is above your irrigation area. Um, that pre-filter is really important and one sixteenth inch mesh is what you need. Um, those leaf eaters I showed are great, robust. If you're doing your own it, window screen is the size of that mesh. Um, and then you want protection from full sun. So the more shade, the better in the Northern hemisphere, the Northern side of your home is gonna be shadiest, um, but you can always create shade. If, if your area is full sun, you can plant around your rain barrels or build a trellis around it, things like that, um, put shade cloth over it, that kind of thing. Um, and and that, uh, keeping it shaded does two things. I mean, any material lasts longer if it's protected from full sun, but it also keeps, it helps regulate the water temperature. You don't want the water heating up too much in the tanks. Level ground is very important. Any large tank or any multi-barrel system, the whole thing has to be level. People ask me if they're doing the multi-barrel, do they want them to kind of step down for water flow? And the answer is no. And actually, I'm going to go back one slide just to make a point. This person, it looks like a split level, but these are two separate systems um, because all the water levels throughout the whole system, no matter what tank your uh, tank type you're doing. So if, if all of these barrels were connected, the whole system would not fill beyond the top of the lowest level, which would lose a lot of storage from these guys. So each, each separate our catchment system um, has to be level and you see so there's that's the inlet for the upper system and then this is the inlet for the lower system but you see there's a lot of flexibility to what you can actually do on a property okay so as far as the irrigation areas this just demonstrates that this this person has a big old tank here and these look like the the bushman tanks um, and that may be servicing this yeah, here, and then they have a separate set of tanks here and a separate larger tank here. So they have different zones where they're irrigating, where they have a localized water source for each one. Um, now, you may be wondering how are these tanks collecting? There's something called wet conveyance where you can actually take water from a downspout, pipe it underground and back up in. That's a little more technical. There's more considerations, and we decided for a DIY workshop um, that we wouldn't include details on that. But the other thing that may be happening here, um, this system here collecting from the roof, this roof is going to be generating a lot of water. So some people have one roof tide system and then they pump water into secondary storage. So that's another way to accomplish something like this. So this is just going to be collecting all year long. Um, and then as it fills, you pump water into other storage vessels, non-roof tide. So let's talk a little bit more about irrigation and how to get that water to your plants. So the simplest way is a watering can. And a lot of people um, consider this to be, you know, people are at all different readiness levels. Um, and I, some people order 
their barrels and their kits and all the drip irrigation uh, equipment all at once and others um, do the barrels as a first step and then kind of figure out the irrigation system afterwards. Um, so a watering can is the simplest. And if you're doing just one or two barrels to start with, you probably don't want to connect to an automated irrigation system off the bat. The proportions just aren't quite right for that. But because of that high quality water, if you have house plants, plant starts, if you're going to start small, I encourage people to start wherever you're comfortable um, and whatever your budget allows. So um, just start with a watering can and see how happy all those plants get. Um, potted plants really benefit from rainwater because all those, all the stuff that accumulates in the, the city water or well water, it doesn't have anywhere to go in the pots. Um, so you'll find potted plants are really happy with rainwater. Um, and then there's a gravity fed drip irrigation system. And what I'll say when, when Blue Barrel first started, we just so we figured out the rainwater catchment system and we sold the barrels and the kits to make that. Um, and pretty quickly, it was like the next question was, well, how what, how do we get this water to the garden? Um, so over time, we've developed a subspecialty in gravity fed drip irrigation systems. Um, it's very efficient. It does have certain design limitations. So those would be irrigation lines need to be below the water level in your barrels or tanks. And over the course of the season, the water level is going to go down. So you notice that many people put um, their tanks up on a little platform or some cinder blocks just to get them above that soil level. You don't, water will always go downhill until it has nowhere else to go. So you don't need a lot of elevation. Um, it, a lot of elevation will give you more pressure, but a gravity fed system will work between, you know, zero and up. It shouldn't really be above six PSI, really. You want to, so normally a normal range for a gravity fed system is usually between zero and two PSI. It's very low pressure. You want to make sure to be using non-compensating emitters. Um, there's compensating drip line, which is actually meant to balance pressurized water through, um, and, and gravity fed water can't really overcome um, that. And then irrigation, uh, the ir irrigation field reduces with, so that means the, the water can go over a few bumps and grades, but the more of that, um, the less distance you'll be able to cover. So um, the ability to keep the line flat will kind of um, flat or slightly downhill trending will increase your water distribution in a gravity fed system. Um, we, I do have a blog with a lot of starting points on gravity fed drip that will give you more detail. So I'll just point that out and you can find that bluebarrelsystems.com if you search irrigation or gravity irrigation, it should come right up. Um, and then lastly, you can, you can pump the water. So if you need to go uphill, you absolutely can't do that with gravity. So, um, you can use a pump, a transfer pump or a, um, a utility pump. Um, I, I personally am not a pump expert. Um, we've specialized in, um, the gravity fed applications, but if you're comfortable with pumps or if you, you know, usually someone at, uh, someone who sells pumps can advise on what kind of pump you need to achieve kind of the distance that, and the pressure that you're looking for. Um, so those pumps will require usually electricity and a, a filter and you need a filter anyway on a gravity fed, any drip irrigation system needs a fine mesh filter. Um, and then you're going to want to keep this irrigation system separate from a main tied irrigation system. So a lot of you may already have irrigation tied to city water. Um, and just keep in mind that um, anything connected to a rain barrel is going to need to be separate from that. You can't combine potable and non-potable sources for safety reasons, and you can't combine pressurized and non-pressurized sources for practical reasons. So it actually won't work. So well, one thing you can do if you already have zones set up, you can just have your rain barrels duplicate service one zone, and then you can control that zone, turn that zone off when your rain barrels are full and turn it back on um, when they're when they're empty. Um, so here's a little more detail on gravity fed drip. Um, the parts you need are really simple. You do need a fine mesh filter and that's what this is right here. Um, it's a streamlined filter. So for uh, often you're used to seeing like a big cartridge shaped thing. Um, 
uh, it's called a Y filter and we don't use those for gravity fed because they take the water on a loop and we want to keep the water on a very streamlined course. These are actually a lot cheaper and smaller and better looking in my opinion. Um, and then an irrigation timer, you need one specifically meant for, for low or no pressure. Um, so if you try to use one of those egg shaped timers that you get in a hardware store, um, those require pressure to close fully. So you'll, you'll turn it on and you'll think it's working and you'll feel really good about yourself. And then you'll go out in the morning and your rain barrels be drained because the thing didn't close. So you have to have a mechanical on and off um, and then a very simple adapter. And then that gets you to your tubing system. So here's an example. This six barrel system um, is irrigating this, you know, front yard garden by gravity feed. So um, it all comes together in that way. So what do you think? It's 620, Liz. Do we have time for this video or not? It's five I think minutes. We've got some time. We got some time. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to play a video. Um, and this is a short video that I took a number of years ago um, that really kind of shows you the gravity fed drip. So for five minutes, we'll take a break and do this. Hi, I'm Jesse Savo. I'm the founder of Blue Barrel Rainwater Catchment Systems. And today I'm going to show you our gravity fed drip irrigation system that I just installed yesterday and today, actually. Um, but I'm starting here. Um, this one I installed about a year and a half ago, and if you go to our website, which is Blue Barrel System, you'll find a blog all about gravity fed drip, and I have a picture of this when it was just installed, so you can see how much it's grown in the last year and a half. Um, but anyway, this uh, little perimeter garden is full of pollinators, and it's irrigated solely with the water that we catch in these seven barrels. This is a classic Blue Barrel rainwater catchment system. Um, I have drip irrigation coming off of this far end, um, and it feeds um, this garden and actually this will irrigate this garden. Um, we live in California, which has a long, dry, hot summer. Um, and those seven barrels will actually irrigate this um, for most of the summer, um, depending exactly when it starts raining again, but it lasted all summer before. Um, so anyway, I haven't touched that in about a year and a half. The irrigation lines are still there. Um, it's on a little gravity fed irrigation timer. Um, and I'm going to show you some of these parts more close up um, over on the other system that I just installed today. So let's head over um, to the other side of the yard. So this was my weekend project today. Um, first of you, and you may have seen a video of me describing this before, we tucked four more barrels behind this shed. Um, this is not a roof tide system. We have no gutters here, but what we do, you know, we have so much water available to us from our the roof of our little bungalow that when those seven barrels fill and have another three in front, um, we just pump the water into these four. Um, and it's still set up just like a blue barrel system, all under plumb. Um, but that allows us to keep catching water from our roof tide systems, and we have even more water here. Um, so I set this up originally so that we could do gravity fed drip. Um, I'll just go over these parts with you. Um, so every blue barrel system comes with a drain valve that's ready to connect a drip irrigation system to. Um, I'll do a little weeding while we're at it. Um, this is our streamlined drip irrigation filter. Um, a fine mesh filter is really, really important for drip irrigation. You don't want to clog your emitters. Um, and then that feeds into our solar. You, know, you can actually see on this side, if you bring the camera around, there's a solar panel there. So this operates on solar recharge batteries. Um, we sell all these parts and batteries in our online store at BlueBarrelSystems.com. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are worried they don't have good solar access. This will operate with regular AA batteries if you're worried about um, solar access. But anyway, um, we have a dial here. You can set the frequency and duration. Right now I have it set to do um, 30 minutes every 20 hours. Um, and that should be enough for now, but it's more of an art than a science. So I'll just see how my garden does. Um, I have my drip line coming over here. And the kit I used was our drip irrigation kit with inline emitters. We have another version that's bubbler emitters, but all of this drip equipment is um, designed specifically to work with without pressure. Um, this is a non-pressurized system. So um, that's the key. When you store water in rain barrels, you have to figure out how to distribute it. So um, take a look. I'm actually going to turn the water on. And keep in mind, there's no pressure here. But if you listen, you'll hear it start up. And check out, check out how well that water comes out. Now, again, there's no pressure. This water is coming from those rain barrels. So we're using a timer that's specifically meant for 
non-pressurized uses, we're using a filter and a whole drip irrigation kit that is meant for non-pressurized systems. So again, you don't want to use regular drip equipment or compensating line. Um, you won't get good output. Now, what's going to happen as the summer goes on, it's going to get hotter, right? And also the water in my in my tanks is going to get lower and lower. So as as the water dries down, I'm actually going to lose pressure. I have probably about one and a half pounds of pressure being generated from um, the three foot elevation on those barrels. That's going to get even less and less. So as time goes on, you know, after a month or so, what I might do is come and increase the duration from 30 minutes to maybe 45. And then by the time I'm really low at the end of the summer um, to, to 60 minutes. Um, but I just kind of play, see how wet my soil is. I see how well my plants are doing. I see what the weather's like and I adjust accordingly. Um, these timers do have a sensor on them. So if it happens to rain, the timer will automatically not turn on. Um, so we don't waste this precious water that we've stored. And actually I just threw a tank gauge. You know, you wanna know how full your barrels are. Um, I'm just gonna read this little tank gauge and I can see the water level. So right now I'm almost full, but as this goes on, I'm gonna um, watch that gauge move. So anyway, I hope this was instructive. Do check out our website, bluebarrelsystems.com. We again have a blog. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, well, let me get us back into presentation view. Great video, glad we showed it. Yeah, and my favorite part, now I have to scroll over to where we were, is when you can hear the water through the lines. Did you all hear that? That's, um, it's like, it's it's really water surging through there, um, you know, if, if you set everything up right. So I do encourage you to use the, you know, we have a lot of free informational resources on our, our website too about um, how to think through your gravity fed drip irrigation system. Um, so moving on, we'll talk a little bit more about passive. Um, so overflow options, basically, wh where do you want your tank overflow to go? Or maybe you're thinking just um, passive rainwater harvesting altogether, um, which can be really beautiful features. So basically, how do we shape our landscape to invite that water in? Um, one strategy is called a rain garden. Um, so these are usually, this slide says 10 feet away from a structure. I've heard 15, um, but the point being, you don't want it right up against your structure. And here they have, you know, you see that downspout. And instead of having that go underground, they have it piped into um, this rocky swale. And then you have this dugout where you're usually going to have a gravel layer and then a planting mix. Um, and then you can plant it with beautiful plants and you can get um, plant lists locally, I think, for whatever is going to do well with this wet, dry, um, uh, you know, habitat for plants. And then just imagine you could have a rain barrel system here, rain tank with that diverter that sends the overflow back down your downspout and have. So if you really wanted to do it all, um, that's how you start thinking about it. These photos are from Tucson, actually. I've, I've been here a tour with Brad Lancaster, but um, you can see sort of the before, which is this clay soil collecting all that water um, in their monsoons. And then here's uh, the, the rain garden. But you can see, I mean, the point being that the whole area is sunken. So we're probably pretty used to seeing landscapes on mounds. And it's just rethinking that if landscapes are sunken, um, they can actually do a much better job retaining water. Swales are something you can do on a sloped property. So swales are sort of a snaking feature that goes on contour um, to invite water to, instead of just flow, to stop and think about it for a minute. So, um, you know, here's the cross section where you dig out and then you actually create a little berm for an additional blockage. And then this is called a lens. The water creates a lens under there and just has a lot of time to infiltrate and it slows the flow of the water um, that hill. Here's another cross section um, just to illustrate the idea a little bit more of that, that cut and fill. So, well, I think this looks like a daily axe photo, I think. Is that right, Liz? Um, so I don't know if you want to say anything specific about this project, but the point being, you know, the, the rocky surface that you can even walk on is also infiltrating water and um, that tank is probably irrigating this beautiful landscape and also creating a corridor for people. Anything else to say about that one, Liz? We'll no. have a volunteer, volunteer day in December. Stay tuned. Great.
Okay. Uh, Bioswale or beauty corridor. Okay. So often, you know, you go by these and you don't even know that you're looking at water retention features, but you can see here um, that instead of shunting the water off, here's a curve cut. They're actually asking water from the street to go into these basins to keep these trees watered. That's more of an urban setting. Um, and then just other things to think about, any opportunity to increase permeable surfaces. So think driveway strips, think as much pavement as you can tear up. And what's next? And this is another Daily X project. So this is actually um, increasing the living sponge, applying mulch. So this is a lawn conversion. Um, lawns, even though they are vegetated, really don't provide much habitat value and they don't provide a lot of water infiltration either. It's a very compact surface and often people treat them with pesticides and they take a lot of water. So anyway, um, this is just a process of, it's called sheet mulching where you put cardboard over and that kind of kills out the grass, but all that organic matter gets composted in, including the cardboard. Um, and it gets covered with a thick layer of mulch. So the cardboard blocking the weeds as well. Um, so that's kind of a quick and easy way to convert a lawn and get a lot of organic matter that's going to increase that living sponge um, where that's going to infiltrate a lot of water. Putting it all together, this is another Daily X picture. Liz, is this City Hall or the Kavanaugh Center in Petaluma? That is City Hall. Okay, yeah, so um, they've got their rain tanks and you can see this one exits here to this really nice area. They've got this, to me, this looks like kind of a before and after where they've done, they did the active first and then they did the passive and they have this nice area of a rain garden and then they do have the existing drain is still there, but look, they've blocked it. Um, water will still get there. There won't be a flooding issue here, but um but a lot less water is going down the drain with a landscape like this. Okay, so bringing it all back together, we're almost done here. We're almost ready for some questions. Here's that water cycle again. And this is a graphic we use a lot at Blue Barrel, but you have all that wonderful evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and here you have a roof and now you have some storage. So um, the hardscape runoff, runoff is captured for beneficial use and infiltration. And you're really restoring that infiltration link in the hydrologic cycle and making your environment more beautiful at the same time. Um, so I hope that concept stuck with you. Um, this graphic is from Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, but it's the basins of relations. So, you know, nature knows no boundaries. So you might be taking on a project on your property, um, but everyone will benefit. And if we all did it, um, we all share the watershed. So whatever we can do on our own property to things back to life is really a benefit to the whole community. Key takeaways, again, so this is repeat at this point, but we have a water storage issue, not a water shortage issue. It's up to us to invite the water to stay instead of telling it to leave. Um, the Santa Rosa rebate is available, as Liz said, if you happen to be a Santa Rosa rate payer. Um, and I will say many municipalities do have um, some sort of rebate or incentive, so you could check with your own city or county. Um, and there's many ways to maximize water storage in your mini watershed on your landscape. So think active and passive and just think slow it, spread it, sink it, store it and share it. All right, so I do have a resource slide and if I understand, I think this deck will be shared. Um, but the American Rainwater Catchment Systems Association is the trade association. And if you really want to research or find um, professionals in your area that can help, they have a professional accreditation program, they have an annual conference, and they have they do a lot of research in partnership with universities. So um, they get really deep into rainwater harvesting. Um, I always recommend the Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands books by Brad Lancaster. They are amazing and very readable. There, it's a two volume series. One focuses more on past and the other more on active. Um, and then Brad Lancaster also has other guides um, on his website. And then bluebarrelsystems.com is um, my company's website. And we have lots of tools for DIYers, lots of planning tools that you can use for free. Um, and then for those who do want to go that route, we have, um, we have a whole system set up for ordering a do-it-yourself kit and customizing a system. Um, and then that interactive roof water calculator is permadesign.com. Um, really cool tool if you want help measuring uh, the surfaces on your roof. 
So with that, I'll say thank you and turn it back to Liz. And Liz, you'll have to tell me um, uh, when to advance the slides. Yeah, certainly. Thanks so much, Jesse. If you want to go to the next slide, I just have two things I want to highlight. First and foremost, great presentation. Thanks for rocking that and sharing all of your knowledge. You covered quite a lot. Um, so just as a reminder for folks who are in attendance, if you are a Santa Rosa water customer, you will be entered into a raffle to win a rain barrel. At the end of this program, you'll be prompted to fill out a survey. The survey will only be for Santa Rosa water customers. Hopefully in the future, we can offer this service and raffle to our other contract areas, but please fill out that survey. And again, as a reminder, this program is recorded. We are gonna be sharing the recording and the resources in an email in about a week. Within that email, we also have a survey to solicit your feedback. We would really appreciate that folks take the time to fill out that survey as it helps us improve our programming. And then finally, if you enjoyed this program, we are also hosting it again in Spanish. So the next slide will highlight our Spanish program. We're doing this again with another guest presenter. Um, it's going to be on November 8th. 5.30 to 7. And hopefully, if you know anybody who is interested and would like to learn about this presentation in Spanish, please spread the word. We would really appreciate that. And without any further ado, it is time for questions. There's been a lot going on in the chat and the Q&A, so I'll try to uh, capture all of it. If anybody has submitted questions in the chat box, um, please be sure that they get inputted into the Q&A so that I don't miss them. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I'll kind of bounce around in the Q&A as there are, are some themes happening here. Um, first question I see after I've scrolled around is what kind of paint do you use to paint the barrels? Okay. Yeah. So I can't, um, I, I'm not going to recommend a specific brand, but you, a lot of people use a spray paint. Um, you, at a hardware store, you can go and find outdoor rated spray paint that bonds to plastic. Um, and we do have two blogs on our website. One thing that will help is actually sanding the surface first that will adhere. Um, and then we had actually someone write a guest blog about the decorative painting. And I think they use an acrylic paint and there's actually a coat that you can put over it. Um, so yeah, I would, I would encourage you to the search bar at bluebarrelsystems.com is a great place to find the specific content you're looking for. If you put paint or painting in there, um, you'll find a couple of how-to articles on painting. Nice. Thank you. Uh, how do barrels hold up in earthquakes? What a good question. So um, in the code, it's not actually, I, I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way. I think generally pretty well. Um, the, it's not required to strap barrels unless the dimension of the tank is more than twice as high as it is wide. Um, and then it is required to strap them. We do also have a blog about strapping for earthquake safety. What I recommend if you're going to strap them, you use a nylon ratchet strap, like the type you get at an automotive store. If you go on Google, you'll see a lot of pictures of people who have used that really thin kind of aluminum plumber's tape um, for strapping rain barrels. And um, the reason I don't recommend that, A, it's thinner, it's really not as strong, but most rain barrels are made out of plastic. And with seismic activity, you know, the, the metal on plastic is not good. It's going to kind of chip away at the barrel. Um, but no, in especially in the city of Santa Rosa, we Blue Barrel was founded in 2012. And was it 20... 13 or early 14 when there was the big quake in American Canyon. Anyway, we had a big quake and we had a number of customers by then in this area that had systems already. And I was sort of expecting to get some feedback about, you know, barrels toppling and all this kind of stuff. And we got none. Um, we actually had one person wrote in and said her downspout, the, the inlet hose detached and she had to go reattach it. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that an earthquake would not topple a system, but water is very heavy. The code requirement doesn't require any strapping. I mean, those barrels are really ballasted down quite well. I think you'd have more trouble actually, if the barrels were empty, you might get see a little more toppling in that case. Oh, nice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. We had a couple of folks asking about cost estimates for different types of systems. I don't know if you have a sense of, um, on average, what barrels cost and different types of systems. Yeah, you know, it's been a long time since I've um, shopped around for other types of systems. But what I know, um, gosh, and I, I don't know if this is 
current, but the, the larger tank systems are going to be more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking for a rain barrel um, online, like a prefab kind of thing, you don't see them under a hundred dollars anymore, usually two or three and, you know, shipping, if they're shipping a barrel to you, it depends. Um, at Blue Barrel, our systems are under a dollar fifty per gallon installed. So often you want to compare, you just want to look around and see what you find. Prices have changed a lot too. The reason I'm saying my numbers might not be current other than for Blue Barrel, and I don't want to spend too much of people's time talking about Blue Barrel pricing because that's all on our website. Um, but the the plastics pricing has gone up a lot and transport costs have gone up. So I'm afraid I, I'm afraid to give solid numbers at this point. You just have to um, see what you find find online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, in working with the RCDs, I've been hearing a lot of folks mention like a dollar fifty to two dollars a gallon is around an average price right now. Okay. All right. So that's per gallon of storage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but we have rebates available to, to help to offset those costs. Yep. Um, do you have any concerns around roof material and getting any sort of toxins in the rainwater? Yeah, so we also have a blog on our website about that. I will, I'll give you some um, information that most rooftop surfaces are actually totally okay. So the most common rooftop uh, surface you see around is an asphalt composition shingle. Um, and a lot of people wonder about that, but asphalt's actually inert. There's no toxins that come off of asphalt directly. The bigger problem is those gravelly bits. So that's why that pre-filter is really important. That leaf eater that showed in a couple of slides, I actually have one here if I can uh, hold on <laughs> awkward pause but um this is what the leaf eater looks like uh, this one's all wrapped up but it's this nice stainless steel mesh and this just tacks onto your wall and the water free falls onto this and then the attachment here can go on to a two by three downspout or a three by four or this adapter comes off and it can go into a round pipe downspouts. So this is a really, I highly recommend um, the leaf eater for the gravelly bits. Um, so, and, and really, so the rainwater is not potable. You can't drink it, but you can irrigate edibles. Um, people, so, so our whole, all this water gets into our environment anyway, right? I mean, this water comes direct, whatever's on your roof is getting directly onto your garden. Um, and the plants themselves don't uptake. Plants are amazing. They filter out all this stuff and they uptake pure water. So if you eat a tomato and keep in mind, farmers don't irrigate with potable water often. Um, so if you eat a tomato, the, the water that actually gets up that stem and into the fruit is totally pure, purified by nature water. Um, so you don't have to worry about uh, irrigating edibles um, with most roof surfaces. The, the roofs that you do have to worry about a little bit are if you have a copper roof. Now those aren't very common, but co copper is an herbicide. Um, so that your garden might not like that water as much. And then same with any wood shingle or cedar shake. Um, that Those are usually treated with fire retardants. Um, so you wouldn't want to bathe your garden in that. Um, but otherwise any tile, you know, the terracotta tile, those are okay. They're, they're less efficient because they're more porous, but you still get a lot of water out of, off of them. They get you maybe 85% collection efficiency as compared to 90 on asphalt shingle and 95 with, um, like a standing seam metal roof, for example. Um, but really very little concern about what's coming off your roof for yeah. irrigation. And again, I, I hope I made it clear that you're not going to drink directly out of a rain barrel or tank. <laughs> does the code require that you actually have the non-potable sticker on your barrel? It sure does. Yep. Wonderful. Uh, if somebody has solar panels on their roof, does that alter calculations and considerations? No, no. I mean, so you can use the same calculation and it actually does increase your collection efficiency because solar panels are really smooth. Um, so say you have a terracotta roof that has 85% collection efficiency and then you have solar panels on top of that, you're getting the higher efficiency for that area. What, the numbers I gave you, the 0.6 um, per inch per square foot, that's actually a, that's a, that, that has a safety built in. It's actually 0.623. Um, so the highest collection efficiency, you're going to get more than the 0.6, but those collection efficiencies 
all of this is really for guesstimating because you don't know how much rain you're going to get. So we use the 0.6. We say it doesn't matter a whole lot what kind of roof surface you have because all of those differences are minimal enough that you can do a rough calculation with the 0.6. Nice. Thank you. Uh, we've had a couple of folks asking about professional help. One person in particular asked if you're available for consultation. Uh, maybe that can be one question. The second question, do you have any resources for folks to try and uh, get support for installation of rain barrels? Yeah, that is actually really difficult. And unfortunately, I don't offer site-based services. You know, Blue Barrel has taken the direction it has, and we, we serve customers all over the country. So my job is running an online retail store and managing inventory and, you know, getting it. We, I, I don't do site-based services. And I'm actually, I, I used to live in Santa Rosa and I no longer do. Um, but it's been difficult, to be honest, finding installers. And I actually turn to Daily Acts because I feel like anyone in the local area might be connected with Daily Acts. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter where you are, if you're if you're planning to do a big project where you want to hire a professional designer and do larger tanks, the ARCSA website would be a good place to find professionals who have that ARCSA professional certification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great resource. We can be sure to include that as well. And one addition that I may recommend is the quell, qwel.net. It's a great resource um, and I think is best suited for those DIY systems. And if somebody is interested in working alongside um, a professional or a handy person, we have a couple folks that we've been working with pretty closely that I would love to be able to recommend. But definitely echoing Jess Jesse, if you're looking for a larger, more engine engineered system, I would probably look at that ARCSA website. Yeah, I think so. And I would say what we've done at Blue Barrel, we've actually made a huge effort to make this available for DIYers. Um, so we we do focus on DIYers, but and we don't recommend installers either. But what we tell people is that if you don't want to do it, a local handy person certainly could. I mean, the I, I wrote the instructions and I'm actually not that handy, believe it or not. I have the design background and Blue Barrel sort of came together with a lot of stars aligning. Um, and uh, but but the instructions are written by and for people like me who are like, this is cool and I want to do it. And I just need someone to tell me photo illustrated and with videos like step by step how to do it. So mm -hmm. um so yeah, I, I've focused on supporting DIYers really, and then um, anyone you can find locally that could, and even a friend um, could probably help you. I can definitely attest to the DIY system and the how-to guide that you offer, Jesse, is really beneficial and highly recommend. Um, can we use rainwater for chickens and for showers for humans? Yeah. So chickens, yes. Um, livestock, birds, absolutely. I mean, they're out drinking this water anyway. And what I say about pets is if your pets drink out of the toilet, then they can drink rainwater. Um, it, it's really us humans that have these very sensitive guts um, and all of these liability concerns. And what the showers? Uh, so I don't know. I don't want to get into tricky code issues. I mean, I mean, it, for outdoor shower, if you're plumbing rainwater indoors, that's a permitted project. So the what what I showed mostly and with these irrigation systems, you do not need a permit to do these um, if your tanks are under 5,000 gallons in size. Um, and if you're irrigating or having electrical inputs or anything like that, it's the electrical inputs, it would be plumbing indoors, it would be trying to do a potable system, which can be done, um, but those need to be permitted. Um, and, and I'm I'm not an expert in that, but yeah, if you're trying to plumb indoors to service a shower, talk to your permitting agency and maybe get some starting points and resources there. Nice, thank you. Um, do barrels need to be flushed of sediments? So th that's really a design question. The, the blue barrel system is under plumbed. So the sediments, first of all, we're, we're keeping most of the sediments out at the inlet with the rough filtration, um, but there will be micro sediments. Um, some of them create what's called a biofilm on the inside of the barrel, um, and you don't need to clean that. So ARCSA did a study on that. It used to be part of a normal rain barrel maintenance regimen, common sense that so you scrub it out once a year. Well, they researched it and found out the water stays cleaner um, if you don't do that, if you don't scrub it, because the um, there's sort of a light composting action, action that happens in that biofilm and the biofilm attracts these little particulates and it kind of keeps the water very alive, um, which is kind of cool. Um, 
so if it depends on the design though, because if you have, um, if you're doing a rain barrel and you have a spigot six inches off the bottom and then you're trapping water underneath, you may need to check that periodically and see what's collecting um, in there. But generally speaking, a rainwater system is a pretty low maintenance proposition. Thank you. We've had a couple of folks asking for a refresher on the rebates. Uh, so for Santa Rosa water customers, um, and actually for all of the Sonoma County right now, including Petaluma, you can receive up to 50 cents a gallon. For Santa Rosa, please check out the City of Santa Rosa's website and their Water Smart portal. Be sure to get pre-qualified before you do any of your work. That is a really key component of the Santa Rosa process. Um, and again, we'll send resources in our follow-up email. All right, so a lot of long questions here. Uh, can you speak to the mesh requirement once again? Is that a Santa Rosa requirement or is it an overall requirement? So uh, the way the code, it's actually at the level of the state. The, the code, um, it's in the California plumbing code. Um, and the way that works, there's sort of a model code that's written that gets adopted by different states or not. And I can't speak to what other states have going on, but any state or agency who has adopted code probably has that in it. And it's good. You know, a lot of people get, um, you know, eerie when they hear about code, but I actually really appreciate the rainwater code because there are a lot of rumors out there that rainwater harvesting is illegal, which is actually not true. And what the code does um, is it helps make everybody more comfortable that this is being done safely and it helps make regulators more comfortable. Um, and you can guarantee that if your city or county is offering incentives that it's not illegal. Um, so I just want to make sure people know that if people are out there telling you that rainwater harvesting is illegal, ask them to cite the code because they won't be able to do that. Um, but yeah, 16th inch mesh is a basic, it's a good thing to do. You want to keep the small stuff and the insects out of your system. So that's why that's in there. Nice. Thank you. Uh, can you recommend rain gutters for homes that get snow? Oh, hmm, interesting. You know, I'm not a snowy climate expert at all. So I, I would probably have to tell you to consult a local roofing contractor about that. Um, but people who live in very snowy climates will actually disconnect rain barrels during the winter and it's more of a fall and then reconnect them when when the snow melt um, happens. So it's more of a fall and spring and summer activity um, in snowy climates, whereas in the dry climates, it's much more of a, uh, well, we're irrigating in the summer and collecting in the winter and mm -hmm. doing a little bit of both in the spring and fall. Nice. Thank you. Uh, here's an interesting question related to housing and developments. Let's see uh, what your answer may be. So Leslie is asking, with all of the apartments being built in Santa Rosa, how does that work for the water? They'll be using lots of water for hundreds of units, and many of us are already in established homes that are under mandatory reductions. <laughs> I don't, I mean, that, I, I don't think I can address that personally. I'm not we sure either. About the environmental benefits, but it's a, um, yeah, I, I, that's, that's more of a political concern, it sounds to me. I think so too. Good question, Leslie. Maybe we can bring it up at a city council meeting or something to get that answer. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse, you know, being a previous Santa Rosa resident, Ron is asking just out of curiosity what our uh, what Santa Rosa residents pay per gallon. Do you have a sense off the top of your head? Yeah, I was struggling to find a clear <laughs> answer online, honestly. I, you know, I was hoping someone from the city of Santa Rosa would be here to bounce some of these questions off. I oh, right. I, 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 I don't know. I, I have been paying a water bill and it's been a long time since I looked that closely at it. And often, you know, there's a there's a sewer fee in there as well. But I, I don't know per gallon. And it's probably a tiered system, too. Yeah, that seems pretty spot on to what I was finding. That's a tiered system. There are a lot of uh, novelties to how you pay. And there is a proposed increase in pay because of our limitations of water. Mm -hmm. Um, I love Mary was asking some questions about, you know, touring some of your sites. I did a private message saying maybe we should do some tours ourselves, but are you familiar with any sites 
um, that may have blue barrels in place that folks can take a look at? So in the Santa Rosa area, the one that comes to mind is um, the Windsor Community Garden mm -hmm. has one. Um, and then the, the Sonoma County Water Agency, it's really the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership does an eco-friendly garden tour every year. And often they, they always have rainwater catchment systems of some sort. And often there is a blue barrel system on that tour. Um, the last couple of years, they did it online and those systems are featured, including mine. Um, you can still find those videos online. So either, either on the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Part Partnership, it's a virtual garden tour. And then we have those videos also on Blue Barrel's website in the video gallery, or I think um, there's a blog feature kind of featuring the garden tour. Um, but I mean, if you're interested specifically, you know, any company that sells rain barrels is going to have pictures of lots of pictures and videos and including us um i won't uh, but um so that's that's the best the best way to see systems i think but yeah check out the garden tour it's it's a really neat event yeah thanks for the reminder of that i'll, I'll take a look and see if that's something we can include in our follow-up thank you yeah, that, it'll take place in May. I think they've announced the date and I think they're um, still recruiting host sites right now. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, Donna is asking about the dimensions of each barrel. My assumption is she's uh, referring to the blue barrels. Okay, yeah, and the blue barrels are a standard 55 gallon size. So um, you need a two foot by two foot footprint for each one. Nice. And that, that would be true for a lot of standard prefab rain barrel. If, if you're going barrels, tanks are bigger, but mm -hmm. the rain barrels two foot by two foot footprint. Two feet by two feet, 55 gallons each. Great. Um, can you remind us of the mesh material? What is it made of? Oh, okay. So you really, the on, on a leaf eater, this is a stainless steel mesh. It's a really high quality mesh. Um, but you can, if you're doing a DIY thing and you just need to screen the water, you can use window screen, which is made out of, you know, fiberglass usually, I think. Um, that's the same 16th inch dimension. Nice. Thank you. Um, Claire is asking a question about one of the demonstrations of the barrels at a, at a residential site. So with the picture you showed of multiple systems, each with its own inlet hose sharing the same downspout, how does the overflow work? For okay. example, oh, maybe I'll stop there. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You can, I didn't realize the okay. question was. <laughs> uh, for example, can you use a downspout diverter for the upper system and a separate diverter for the lower system, even though they draw from the same downspout? Yes. Okay. I'm glad that question came up because yeah, I get to show my, I may have to unblur my screen, but okay. So first of all, if we did look more closely at that picture, he actually did have two separate downspouts coming down, one from each direction. But if he didn't, you can collect from upper and lower. Um, this is how the downspout diverter seals inside. So the way the overflow works, this is really a reservoir and people, uh, people, wonder, well, how does that capture any water? There's a big hole in it, right? Well, the truth is water doesn't free fall in a downspout. It hugs the edges. So really most of the water that comes down is going to collect in that reservoir and go through. So you install this and the thing, you know, telescopes out or accordions out um, level so that when the barrels are full, the water backs up in the hose and it starts to rise in this column. And now it falls through the middle. So what will happen and, and the overflow will get to the second one. So I think it's most effective if there's more space between the upper one and the lower one. And in heavy rains, you'll have, we have what's called simul, these what's called simultaneous overflow. Um, people worry about that sometimes that they think, oh no, some water's going down the bottom. That's actually really good. You want the inlet and the overflow to be balanced or else you're going to have backup issues and your tank's going to be filled so fast. And then the rest of it's going to be overflowing for the rest of the season. So balanced inlet and overflow is good. And when you get the simultaneous overflow, you can actually have both filling at the same time. So this is a really neat diverter. And we, this is included with our rain kits, but we also sell it as a standalone for people who want to do their own type of rain barrel system, you can still get this diverter. And we have a version that works with two by three, which is this one. We also have a version that works with three by four downspouts and another version for round. 
So that's, that's my, that's the key to the kingdom right there is the downspout diverter. <laughs> oh, you've thought of everything. I love that. Thank you. Um, and it sounds like you actually have addressed one of the other questions that just came in. Someone writes, I installed a diverter that does not take all of downspout water. Is that normal? Yeah. So if it's, if it's that design or similar, it, it needs your, your, it depends on the design of your rain barrel system. So if you're doing a big tank, you probably want to put a PVC pipe straight into it and capture all of that water. But if you're doing a rain barrel system, it's only, and especially if you're doing one that a multi-barrel system where whether you've done the underplumb thing like we do, or whether you're connecting the barrels from the top, you're going to be limited in fill speed by how fast the water can get through those narrower pipes. So if you let the water in too fast, you're going to start to get back up. The other thing is with the, so, so what that, the simultaneous overflow balances, and I, I, I sound like a broken record. We have a blog on our website with videos and a full description of exactly like what does simultaneous overflow mean? I, I, it is balanced inflow is the way I think of it. Um, with the numbers we looked at with, you know, let's just say 30,000 gallons available off your roof. And if you're, if you're doing one of the smaller systems, if you have a four barrel system, that's going to be full. And let's just say um, 10 minutes. And then for the rest of the, so, so the idea that you need to capture all the rain all the time. Now, again, in light rains, it, it, the amount of overflow, simultaneous overflow you get is a function of the size of your roof and how hard it's raining. So if you're collecting from a massive rooftop surface and it's raining really hard, you're probably going to see quite a bit of simultaneous overflow. Whereas in a light rain, all that water is going to go into your, into your barrels. So it's kind of, it's self-balancing really. Um, but the, the point is that it, it balances, it takes the overflow when your barrels are full and yes, sometimes you will see water escaping the overflow, just depending how hard it's raining and how big your collection surface is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one last question here. If someone's barrels run dry in the summer, they've set up their system, but there has been little to no rain. Is there any harm in the barrels being dry in the landscape, just sitting there through the months? No, I mean, I would say, here's what I do. If you have irrigation zones already set up and you can just turn your city irrigation back on at that point, um, I, I don't, I just hose fill them at that point so that I can keep using that gravity fed irrigation system. I think there's some benefit to having the barrels ballasted down just in case there was, if they're completely empty, um, you could have a blowover concern or a topical concern. So keeping some water in there is probably a good idea. But um, hose fill is something you can do if you want to keep using water or just having water stored on site. Great. Thank you. And now this really is the last question. It seems very relevant. Um, can you use more than one level of cinder blocks in order to build up pressure? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, and, and there, there are other, some of the pictures I showed had other kind of platform type things. Yes, you can. You just have to be sure whatever foundation you're building is solid and strong. Um, so it, so yeah, just work, work with someone who knows how to build a foundation. Um, and you can definitely put rain barrels up higher to build up your head pressure. Great. Well, it's 7.01. I want to respect everyone's time. Jesse, again, thank you so much for this valuable presentation and everybody in the audience who's with us still, who attended the program, all of your questions. I hope everybody left uh, learning something new. And if you have any questions, please reach out. I'll send the recording and resources within a week. Really appreciate your time, Jesse. Okay. Until thank next you. time, everybody. Well. Take good care. Have a wonderful evening. Good night, Bye, everyone. everyone.